Since we're talking about uh, gas laws, well, we're since we're talking about air, which is a gas, we can review gas laws. And the only one you got to know is the one where you remember studying P1, B1 equals P2, B2, Charles' law, Boyle's law, I'm kind of talking about this in chemistry. And well, the basic idea is this. If you compress a gas, one thing about gases is, well, they're not liquids. Liquids don't necessarily fill the chamber that they occupy. And not, no matter the volume of a gas, the gas molecules bounce around and fill the chamber that they occupy, exerting a pressure against the vessel wall. So for example, if you can measure the pressure, if you have a liter, uh, one atmosphere, if you cut the volume in half, you double the pressure. That's the relationship when you study this. Okay. So volume has everything to do with pressure. So when, you, when we apply this concept to breathing, the mechanics of breathing, we have to consider a lot of things. The physics of lungs, airways, chest wall, and how they cause changes in lung volume, which creates pressure gradients to move air in and out. That, that's really the whole key there. What is the lung volume? And is air going to move in or out of the lung? That's, that's as simple as I could put it. Now how we make students um, study it is by talking about all the different pressures, how they apply to a transmural pressure, and that's our pressure gradient. So let me walk you through this. Um, we already talked about pressure in the atmosphere. You live under a column of air. We call it the atmosphere. We call it 760 or zero. <coughs> or zero point. But you have to kind of compare it to a pressure somewhere else. Now the pressure in the pleural cavity, I call it the PIP, is negative. So maybe a negative four on average. Relative to atmospheric pressure. But we also have to consider intrapulmonary pressure, or P-pull. Now, I don't know if I defined this one before. P-pull is, sometimes it's called intrapulmonary or intraalveolar. Pressure. Pressure inside those tiny microscopic air sacs. Where I said you have 600 million of them. Now that I can't put a static number to. We need to talk about how that changes. That changes with breathing. It could be 760. It could change to 761, 759. It can change. If it's at 760, air is not going to flow because there's no gradient between the outside and the inside. But if you can change the volume to be a little more or a little less, for example, this one here, let me take a breath in. <laughs> Air is drawn in because you're filling that vacuum. Okay, so you kind of change it to a negative pressure during inspiration. And you change it to a slightly positive pressure for it to take a breath out. So the point is, people, intra, intrapulmonary pressure, it changes with breathing. Okay. So what we have to do is calculate the difference between the inside and the outside. That's P trans. PTR. This time, we're talking about it across the respiratory system, not the vessel wall. That's what we did last time. It's always pressure in, pressure out. That's what I say on this slide. It's always that, by convention. You're just comparing pressure in two locations. So, P-trans is always pressure in minus pressure out. In the respiratory system, the pressure in is intrapulmonary pressure. p 
people, and you compare it to pressure of the atmosphere, which is always 760. So for our lecture for the respiratory system, the P trans is that. All right, so we have to apply that equation to the anatomy and the physiology here. So what you got to do is um, remember what we talked about before the break. Pressure of the atmosphere, um, sorry, it's outside here. Pressure of the atmosphere, just outside your body. It's always zero. But inside the tiny alveolar spaces, it can change with breathing. And you can change it because you can alter the, um, the thoracic volume and change the intrapulmonary pressure. So that's kind of what we talk about, the forces acting on the lung and chest wall. You have to understand that to understand how things change. Over here, I'm going to write forces on lung, and over here, I'll write forces on chest. Chest or thoracic wall, because they kind of oppose each other. I said um, before the break that the lungs are like a balloon. A balloon that's inflated, and then you let it deflate, all you got to do is like take your you know, poke a hole somewhere and the balloon deflates because the rubbery wall of the balloon always wants to collapse in. So usually we say the forces acting on the lung because it's like a balloon act inward. They're a force in. I'll just put the word in. However, if you look at a skeleton, the rib cage is stiff. It doesn't want to collapse like a balloon wants to collapse. Its natural tendency is to stay stiff and conical and open like a cage. In fact, for example, when you want to compress it, when you give someone chest compressions in CPR to try to move blood forward, I mean, if you do it properly, you actually break ribs. The chest does not want to be compressed, okay? So it wants to hold the lung out by being a cage and stiff. So usually we say the forces that act on the chest wall are the opposite of the lung. They don't want to collapse, they want to like stay out. You want the, the rib cage to not be compressed. So I just say the force is on the chest wall because it's stiff and conical. It's a force out. It opposes the forces of the lung. And so basically we describe forces acting on the chest wall as being inward and outward. Okay? They say it's like a spring, it's like a spring out. Another way to think of it is, since we've got this in-out thing, the, four, the lung holds the chest wall in, or the opposite way of thinking of the same thing, the chest wall holds the lung out, so it doesn't collapse. All right, so now those, to define those forces, for the lung, there are two forces that have this inward force. Okay, one is the elastic recoil. Now the elastic recoil that act on the lump are all the elastic fibers that surround the alveolar spaces and the bronchioles. Okay, I describe them as these little black lines. They, they want to collapse the lump naturally. That's why the lung is like a balloon. But the other thing I mentioned before the break was the surface tension forces. Now that's provided by the water that lines the air-water interface on the inside of the alveolar space. So I'm going to abbreviate this EL and ST. And both of those forces are inward acting forces, you know. One, two, they make the lung want to collapse just like a balloon would collapse. The forces on the chest wall, well you, you don't have surface tension, but you have elastic recoil. It's just acting in the opposite way. Because the lung is a stiff rib cage, it's just 
always wants to hold the lump out. Okay. A stiff rib cage holds lung out. They're stuck to each other unless you break that seal, right? Like in a pneumothorax. So, anyways, those are basically the forces. It's just considering the nature of lungs and chest wall, how they are. I've seen uh, paramedic students give chest compressions to a cadaver that I dissected open. And it's pretty messy. When you press down on the chest and the body cavity is open, there's guts flying everywhere. The chest does not want to be compressed. Okay, trust me on this. <clears throat> it's a stiff thing. Well, an easy way to think of it as, because they're pulling on each other in opposite ways, I remember one of my professors described it this way. Imagine you have two glass plates representing lung wall, chest wall. You put a small drop of water in between. You put them together. Now, it's easy to rub the glass plates like that, but when you try to pull them apart, it's very difficult. So that's how, kind of how they're stuck. And if chest wall forces are greater, they're going to pull the lung with it, like when you take a breath in, because your chest does expand with the breath in. And that will draw air into the lungs. But then when the lung collapse, when the lung wall forces are greater when the muscles relaxed, you kind of go back. So it's kind of like this back, back and forth thing. When you take a breath in, breath out. It's just springs kind of pulling on each other back and forth. The point is not to break that seal. So when you study the breathing cycle, of course everyone knows you breathe in, you breathe out. But we consider the moment before you take your next breath. You know, and everyone knows this too. Breathing is a vital sign of life. You, you want to figure out if the person's alive? You've got to check their vitals. What, what do you do? Check, I'm not, I, I just know this. You, you check their respiratory rate, about 15 breaths a minute. What else do you check? Pulse, blood pressure. Okay, I mean, there are other things you could talk about. Um, people think pain is a vital sign of life. There's a doctor in the mid 90s who really thought the medical community should pay close attention to pain because it was something that people ignore. Unfortunately, it started the opioid crisis that we're in now. It's like, oh, okay, we're gonna make all these opioids, and now they're looking at pain. He had good intentions, but they had the wrong outcome. Well, anyways, I digress. Respiratory rate, if you're breathing 15 times a minute, there's a moment before you take your next breath. And at that moment, we call it FRC, well, nothing is moving. Because at that moment, things are still. It's not hard to count breaths. You just watch for the patient's chest to rise and then drop. That's a breath. Right? Mm -hmm. But again, there's that moment before you take the next breath. I'm going to call that FRC. I'll define that in a little bit. I say nothing moves because the forces of the lung wall and the chest wall are equal. Um, chest wall and the knees. Now, if we want to title this section of the notes, is we're going to apply that whole P trans thing and we're going to relate it to these forces acting on the lung and chest wall. Apply the whole P trans, PTR equals P pole minus pressure in the atmosphere, PATM. We're going to apply that to these. Um, Intrinsic forces acting on lung and chest. Twice the J chest, chest wall, not the chest. That includes the viscera, the contents, but just just the chest wall. Um, all right. So uh, what we do is we say at FRC nothing moves. So Let's do this.
And let's start to fill in this equation here. Um, the pressure of the atmosphere for this lecture, living at sea level, it's always zero millimeters of mercury. I'm saying that at FRC, this is the moment before you take your next breath. And at that moment, the air in your lungs has equilibrated with the pressure of the air outside your lungs. So that pressure is also zero. So as you can see, subtraction is not hard. Zero minus zero is zero. All I'm trying to get you to see is that when there is no pressure difference between the inside of your lung and, and outside your body, the transdural pressure is zero. And what that really means is, with no pressure gradient, air does not flow. That's how you interpret the zero. Air does not flow. There's no gradient. No air flow. Done with that. Now, the reason why air isn't flowing is because the, the chest wall, lung wall forces, the four forces over here. So long. Chest. Okay, the forces I'm talking about are the EL, ST, right? The elastic recoil, the surface tension. But for the chest, we just said, uh, they just have elastic <coughs> recoil forces. By the way, they're opposite. They're equal and opposite to each other. So I'll just put an equal sign. When forces are equal, nothing moves. Okay, nothing moves, and there's no gradient. Nothing is happening, basically. Okay, because this is the moment before you take a breath in. So let's take a breath in. Step two, inspiration at the breathing cycle. Inspiration is actually an active process. You have to recruit breathing muscles. recruit muscles of inspiration. And we said those are diaphragm external intercostals. refers to? Ribs. Now, I should say this. Any muscle that attaches to the rib can be used as an accessory muscle of inspiration. Okay. So you have to know those. Um, some other muscles. The scalenes, right? The anterior scalene, for example. They attach to ribs. Uh, pec minor. Uh, serratus anterior. Any muscle that has an attachment to the rib can be used as a muscle you know, accessory to inspiration for breathing, basically. And so you're responsible for that, for, for any, any of those muscles. And I listed pretty much all of them there. Um, let's see here. Well, OK, so you, you use muscles. But what you're going to do is you're going to make the main muscles, diaphragm, external intercostal, it's going to expand the rib cage. Right, so you're gonna, um, these forces are greater. So I'm gonna draw like a little sign that way. These forces are greater. Because basically, you're gonna increase thoracic volume. Just like we talked about before the lecture. The pump handle, bucket handle thing, that, that's this. We're going to make the whole thoracic volume bigger. Now, let's go to our transrural pressure thing.
by making the thoracic volume bigger, you're going to decrease the intrapulmonary pressure to be negative relative to atmospheric pressure. Say negative 1. Minus 0. Pressure of the atmosphere is still 0. So negative 1 minus 0 is negative 1. So again, the thought process is increase thoracic volume, decrease people. But that's the thought process. You're making the volume in the chest bigger. You create a little bit of negative pressure, and air rushes in to fill the vacuum. Air flow in. Into what? Into lungs. You fill the vacuum. Air flows in, and then you equilibrate to zero. Air flows in until you equilibrate and then, you know, to zero. That's the process. So I know I wrote it all out here, but so, yeah, question? Where did you get the negative one from? Oh, I'm saying you decreased it from zero to negative one. Uh, textbooks say you usually change it one point, negative. I guess the real answer is I got it from the book. <laughs> and that, that's significant. You don't have to change the pressure that much. You just have to change it one point, and that's enough to get air to flow in your lungs. That, that means the system is very efficient. If you change this, if you had to change this to a 10 to get airflow, diffi that's difficult breathing. It's hard to do. It's kind of like when you are wheezing due to bronchitis. That's like you have to have a much bigger change, but if in the absence of pathology, that's significant that you only have to change it a little bit. So imagine we have our airways, and then we have our alveolar spaces. When you expand the chest wall, the lungs expand with it. You make the space bigger, you decrease the pressure, right? You increase the volume, you decrease the pressure, and then air rushes in until you equilibrate. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I'll do it one more time. So, you know. Um, first, you, this is where we were at FRC. You were at zero, right? And then you take a breath in, you create a vacuum, um, and then air rushes in to fill the vacuum until you, you pull it. So that's a breath in. So then you just kind of go in reverse for a breath out. Expiration. A passive process, no muscle recruitment. Basically, muscles relax and the lungs recoil. You just kind of reverse it all. Yeah. Now, uh, I guess I'll throw the arrow this way. So now, when you relax the muscles, the, the elastic recall surface tension forces at the lung, those forces are now greater. That's why I said that, that's what allows the lungs to recoil. When lungs recoil, that's the force in. The lungs are pulling the chest wall back. And so you're, you're kind of like, let me take a breath out. Everything collapses, right? So you're decreasing thoracic, block, uh, thoracic volume. And then an instant later, you're increasing uh, the intrapulmonary pressure. That's the whole peephole thing. So basically, just go over here and just change it to, you increase it to say plus one. I'm going to drop the millimeters of mercury just for simplicity. Plus one minus zero is plus one. Plus one millimeters of mercury. Basically, now how you interpret the plus one. Now the inside is positive with respect to the outside. So that creates a gradient for air flow out until you equilibrate. 
air flow out until zero, until you equilibrate. That's the whole thing, right? It is, the math isn't hard, it's just understanding the concept. So the same illustration, at the end of a breath in, you've equilibrated. When you take a breath out, things collapse. There's less space, decreased volume, increased pressure, right, relative to atmospheric pressure. You create a gradient for air to flow until you've equilibrated to zero. So at the end of a breath in, you equilibrate. At the end of a breath out, you equilibrate. And the graph that shows that is the top graph. I mean, you need to know all three graphs, but look at the top graph first. It's monitoring intrapulmonary pressure um, during a breath in and a breath out. When you take a breath in, so we'll just kind of go through it here. Okay, follow the green dot. See the green dot? There you go. So take a breath in. You expand the chest wall, your lung wall expands with this. Yeah, you get negative pressure in there. But the air flows in, and then you what? You you equilibrate, right? So then you take a breath out. You start at zero, and then you, everything's collapsed, so you create a positive pressure. And then air flows out until you equilibrate. So at the end of a breath in, end of a breath out, you're equilibrating each time. Get that straight. Just to go back to that one here. See, see, see how intrapulmonary pressure, I mean, it changes with breathing. But our zero point is way up here. So I just gave you that negative four number because it's an approximate average of it changing. I don't really, tr I've, I've never tried to understand why it changes. It's just I don't want to, so. <laughs> negative, it stays negative, that's the point. If it equilibrates, that's a collapse law. How it changes, as long as it stays negative, well that's fine. And this bottom graph here, what's the volume of air you're actually bringing in and then breathing out? It's about 500. I, that's a half liter, 500 ml, during normal quiet breathing. Okay, so let's go to this here. All right, so the next point is about the surfactants. Um, I, I've been using plus one, negative one. You only have to generate a small gradient to get air to flow. Without surfactants, you'd have, you need like tenfold more. Okay, that's the, like the example I gave of the premature baby. When you're born too early, or you're, you don't have the surfactants being produced yet, so you have to give them to the preemie baby to help them breathe. Okay, so we have in lab um, a pair of bell jar uh, lungs. Let me get that real quick. Let me just show you. And you can look at it in class if you want. Come on. So look at this. What do the what do the balloons represent? Lungs. Lungs. What do you think this represents? Diaphragm. Diaphragm. And so like the stiff plastic tube. I guess that's like your thorax, your thoracic wall. And there's a, a hole in the tube here that represents the airway. And so you can just kind of pull the diaphragm. Do you see how the um, balloons inflate as I pull down and deflate when I push up? You can even hear the breathing. Because when I pull down the lungs inflate, you're increasing the volume inside. So you're sucking air into them, and you can push the air out. Okay, now if I kind of break the seal here, I can't do it anymore. What does that represent? Some kind of pneumothorax, right? When you break the seal, the lung collapses, and you can't inflate it. So that, that's why it's a useful model. It works just like this. So to answer these questions for you real quick, at FRC, the full forces thing over there on the far right, I said the forces are equal. During inspiration, the chest wall forces are equal. During expiration, the lung wall forces are equal. So that's easy. Now, if you have a problem with breathing, it's good for your students to understand how normal breathing is supposed to work. Let's write this equation over here.
Airflow, top of the left. Flow of ink, in this time it's airflow, it's always a pressure gradient, uh, delta P, right? So we've been calling that P trans over R. So that's the equation from this slide. But for us, let's just substitute S for airflow. And for us, the top is like P trans, the pressure difference between inside the lung and outside the body. Now, resistance. Most notably, that will be controlled whether you bronchodilate or bronchoconstrict. What we had pointed out before the break is that it's kind of the, the reverse or the opposite as blood vessels. When you bronchodilate, that's the sympathetic response. Right? And when you bronchoconstrict, that's more the the restful, quiet breathing, parasympathetic response. Well, anyways, that's probably the main control there. The goal is you want there to be less resistance for air to flow in the lungs. And we also talked about the anatomy of the airways, and we went through the whole division thing. And we started at zero before the airway divides, and it divides at the carina. And as you divide, because the airways are getting smaller and smaller as you get through the divisions, you get an increase in resistance to airflow in the medium-sized bronchi because you're decreasing the size of the airway. Now, because the numbers of airways increases so much, I kept giving those big numbers, like 10,000, 20,000, 80,000, or whatever, 600 million, right? That's why you have a huge drop-off in resistance to airflow as you proceed all the way down to the bronchioles. Because there's so many airways, even though they're so small, because there's so many, you have less resistance to airflow. In fact, zero. When you get to the respiratory zone, there is no resistance to airflow. And that's the main thing to take away from if you get to here, respiratory zone. no resistance to airflow in the respiratory zone. There's so many, the, the airways are so numerous as you get to the higher divisions. There's just much more room for air to flow. All right, now the control of breathing happens in the medulla, pons area, your brainstem basically. And um, we're largely functioning to maintain the blood gas CO2, not necessarily O2. Okay, people think you have to tightly regulate O2. But what's the name of the molecule, we just took a test on this, that binds O2 in the blood? Hemoglobin. hemoglobin. Because hemoglobin is so good at binding the O2, you have, have a huge reservoir of O2. You, you usually don't worry about it in terms of it circulating. But CO2 is much more tightly regulated. So that's usually what I teach. And you're breathing to keep blood gases normal for CO2. Hypercapnia is too much. Hypocapnia is too little of the CO2. And so the figure that kind of shows you through it is right here. Hyper, hypo, along with my slide here. Think partial pressure, CO2, it's elevated. The goal is to keep it um, at a homeostatic level. Hypocapnia, the, par uh, the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood gases, it gets too low. So too high or too low, you want to keep it at some functional level. Now, I won't get into the um, 
super crazy details like I did for the power receptor. But know that chemoreceptors are in the same locations as baroreceptors. You have them in the medulla. You have them in the carotid and aortic bodies, right? Just like you did for the baroreceptor. And let's say if arterial CO2 is too high, you want to increase the breathing. If you increase the ventilation, you return it back to normal. That having been said, how do you correct this imbalance? Decrease. All right, now the, the reason why it's a problem is uh, CO2 helps regulate pH. Now, if you have um, too much, when it gets to the brain, there are no proteins to buffer the acids. Uh, that becomes a problem. Now, normally, it's about 40 millimeters of mercury. So when it gets to 45, you double it. Okay, you double your breathing rate. For hypocapnia, it turns out CO2 is a vasodilator in the brain. When it gets too low, you basically restrict blood vessels and you pass out. Okay, I mean, I'm sure we've seen people faint at one time or another. However, when you stop, when you faint, you stop breathing, well, that allows the CO2 to accumulate and you wake up. Um, I've had that experience with cadavers. I'm presenting and I hear a thump. Somebody, somebody passed out. That's happened twice. I've seen that happen twice. Never in this class. It always happened um, in some clinical setting. Um, I feel bad when people pass out. And the main thing I worry about is they don't hit their head on something. One time, a big guy caught a smaller student. Um, she, he caught her, and I was glad. The other time, the guy just fell and nobody caught her. Uh, so when I present cadavers next week, if you see someone getting kind of woozy, you know, at the sight of a cadaver, at the smells of a cadaver, don't let them hit their head. But anyways, you can help. Um, if you see someone becoming fit, you can sit them down, you can have them re-breathe in a paper bag, right? You've all seen that. That's why when you breathe, breathe your own air, you're helping the CO2 to get back up. All right, so hyper, it could be caused by hyperventilation. You, you panic, uh, you're breathing out too much CO2, and you can pass out. So to help uh, re-breathe your own air. So the regulation of O2, um, you need a big drop before you see an increase in ventilation. Uh, normal PO2 is about 100. You need a big drop to about 60 before you even notice the difference in uh, ventilation. Now, breathing is important. However, something I haven't mentioned yet, you breathe, but some of that, not all of that air is reaching the alveolar space. So this gets to the um, idea of anatomical dead space. Now, dead space is kind of a misnomer. There's nothing dead. Imagine our system as an Erlenmeyer flask, and you take a nice, deep breath in. Normally, when you breathe in, it's about 500 ml fresh air. Go outside and breathe the fresh air, and or well, breathe fresh air in here. I would say, of that 500, maybe roughly uh, 350 reaches the alveolar space, and about 150 is just sitting in the conducting airways. That's the dead space volume. It's just the air sitting in the conducting airways. Not available for gas exchange. So that's the idea of 
dead space. So um, there's a term called alveolar ventilation rate, where you calculate how much fresh air is actually reaching the uh, alveolar sac for gas exchange. You gotta subtract out the dead space volume, right? So basically that's what I'm teaching you to do here. Um, if you have dead space volume and you account for it, you can calculate the alveolar, ven alveolar ventilation rate. A good example is, um, is a whole snorkel example. If we reduce the ventilation below that of dead space volume, there actually is no fresh air reaching the lungs at all. You could suffocate. That's why, you know, just to d dispel the myth, can you sit at the bottom of a swimming pool and breathe through a garden hose? If you think you're smart and you think you can do it, you're actually being very dumb, right? That's a stunt that you would, you would kill yourself. Why? A garden hose is super long. You just increase your dead space volume like a, like a, like a thousand percent. So you might, you don't even have one breath of fresh air. I mean, it's like as soon as you breathe out in the hose and breathe in one time, none of that is fresh air. You're just rebreathing your own air. And um, you would suffocate, okay? So let's think of like a snorkeling tube. Let's say the snorkeling tube has a volume of 350 and the regular anatomical dead space is 150. Well, then that's like 500, and that's, the, that's a normal breath in, so you're not getting any fresh air there either. So that we, that's why we consider the dead space volume to the shorter snorkel. And so uh, basically, just no snorkel, just look at this, just regular dead space volume. Here's how you calculate it. So the first thing I'll write is, how do you calculate ABR? First, subtract out dead space volume. So look at my top example. You're sitting down, normal quiet breathing. Let's assume regular tidal volume is 500 ml, dead space volume 150 ml. Subtract it out. 500 ml minus 150 ml gives you 350 ml. So assume that is your tidal volume. So that's how much air you're bringing in per breath. But now you've got to count the breathing rate. Let's say it's a normal 15 breaths a minute. Multiply. Uh, the units cancel out. So you get uh, 350 times 15. Well, I, I got the math there for you, so. 5250 per minute. Or you can convert to liters. 525 five liters per minute. So instead of like per breath, per minute. That's the, that's the rate, alveolar ventilation rate. And by comparison, you can see that um, it's better to take slow, deep breaths. Even though your breathing rate has decreased down to eight, because you're um, having way more fresh air reach the alveolar spaces, your alveolar ventilation rate is actually improved as opposed to <coughs> short, shallow breaths. And that's why I want you to take more air. And so for questions for you, I mean, could you calculate this, right? So let's some kind of compare here. It's a nice problem I like to ask students to calculate ABR. Let's say Sarah's, her normal ventilation rate during exercise is about six liters a minute. So while at the beach on a warm summer day, she goes for a jog. And, you know, what would her respiratory rate have to be uh, for her to maintain an ABR of six while jogging. And you can assume these normal figures there. So 
So now uh, I'm changing it. So now I'm telling you for ABR is 6. What information do I give you? I don't give you her breathing rate, so that's X. X breaths per minute. And we can assume it's the same as before. You subtract out the dead space volume. So she's getting multiply. I want to change it to liters, 0.35 liters per breath. Could you solve that? Could you solve for x? Uh, let's see, what, what would you do here? So we go divide both sides. like a math teacher now. Mm -hmm. I better get this right. Okay, so I'm solving for x. So I'm going to cross this out. Cross that out. Okay, I'm going to start again. So now, to continue up here, I have x breaths per minute equals, so I'm, I'm going to do the thing where you now you multiply the denominator and you know, flip it. Six liters per minute. are going to cross out. We just cancel. Uh, that's so it's like 6 divided by 0.35. You said it was about 17? Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of how you count. That sounds about right if you're exercising the light jogging the beach. Now this thing, you can read through. The only difference is, now I'm saying she's snorkeling, it's the same deal, six liters a minute. The only thing you have to consider now is she, she has a snorkel that's adding 50 ml more dead space. So the only thing you do in difference of calculation is, well, you should subtract 200 instead of 150. So I'll leave that for you to do. Because after all, it is a question for you. Uh, we'll do that. Let's take another um, break. I still have information to present. Uh, let, let's start again at 11.45. You don't have to leave the room, but if you want to go out and take a stretch break, 11.45. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.